It has been just two days since pregnant Shannon Watts and her two daughters, Bella and Celeste, vanished without a trace from their cozy home in Frederick, Colorado. Before they disappeared, the Watts family seemed like the perfect family of four going on five. But now all hope of seeing them together again, alive, is dead. Chris has confessed to a violent confrontation. He claimed he witnessed his wife murdering their children in cold blood and then killed her in a fit of grief and retaliation. He led police to the bodies. What was left of Shannon, Bella, and Celeste is found concealed in a shallow grave and in two oil tanks on a desolate oil field where Chris worked. Now Shannon's handsome husband, the father of her children, Chris Watts, has been arrested and sits behind bars, accused of murder. At every turn, police continue to uncover shocking new twists. They had the bodies and a confession, but from the start, police doubted Chris's outlandish story. He's already proven himself to be less than credible. In the days following the discovery of Shannon and the children, investigators would continue to try to piece together the puzzle of what actually happened to them. And America could not get enough of this terrible story that was both salacious and terrifying. Now, why would there be such an appetite for this? Why would people be so interested in it? Because this happened in Anywhere, USA to any family USA. This wasn't a fringe family. These weren't people that lived on the edge that you would look at and say, yeah, I can believe that. Now you would look at this family and say, wow, if this could happen to this family, it could happen to any family and that is unsettling. People wanted to know how, why, what happened. I know that because people stopped me on the street and asked, and the questions were not rhetorical. They really wanted to know what is happening in this world. How can this occur? A lot had happened in Chris Watts' life during that week-long period in August. His family was dead. An extramarital affair had been exposed. He had been arrested. Chris's interview, filmed at the home he once shared with his wife and children, had gone viral. In the blink of an eye, America's new Scott Peterson. Reporters were eating up the story, noting that Chris may have looked like a silver fox, but he was really a wolf in sheep's clothing. Chris Watts had become America's most hated father. Right away, the investigation pulled back the curtain on a crumbling marriage that may have led to murder. Behind the cheery family photos and bubbly social media posts, there was a deep hidden resentment, tension, and strife. And on examination, all of those posts were one-sided. They were all put up by Shannon. They were not put up by Chris. Maybe because Chris was too busy having an affair there were money issues and Chris was worried about the financial strain of yet a third child and what it would cause. His feelings were, we're not making it with two children to feed, clothe, and raise, and now there's a third one on the way? But more importantly was an emotional divide between Chris and Shannon, and it had left Shannon distraught in the days leading up to her disappearance. Had their troubles made Chris feel desperate for a way out, desperate enough to kill? So many questions remain. Did Chris's mistress, Nicole, know more about his marital situation than she had let on? Did she have any idea that Chris would soon end the lives of the people who loved him the most? And Chris was about to come clean with what really happened to his family. The story of Chris and Shan Ann Watts, well, it wasn't over in fact. It was just starting to unfold. And I have a sneaking suspicion that made some people really nervous. And that's what's coming up on this episode of The Devil Beside Me, The Chris Watts Story, Husband, 
father, kill her. We started to talk last episode about Chris's mistress, Nicole Kissinger. Now, Chris and Nicole met at work, and sparks flew. They soon began an affair, but according to Nicole, she was not aware that this was an affair, or that she was the mistress, that she was the other woman. She says she thought she was dating a guy who was in the midst of a mostly amicable divorce. Once news of Shannon's disappearance spread, Nicole had gone to police of her own free will to speak to them about her involvement with Chris. But was she a hero in this story? Or is it possible, like Shannon's parents believe to this day, that she tried to help Chris? And when it all started coming unraveled, when it all started hitting the wall, she got scared and bailed. Was she actually helping him and got cold feet and decided, save yourself, girl? She was never arrested or charged. However, is there more than meets the eye with Nicole? Sure, she had been helping police. It seemed like she was on their side and not her lovers. She had told them all about Chris and Shannon's many issues. She told them Chris had confided in her that he was no longer in love. She said he talked about living alone. She basically handed them his motive on a silver platter. But Nicole also told police she had no idea that Chris and Shannon were expecting a baby, baby number three. She says as far as she knew, their marriage was kaput. Now, there are thousands of armchair detectives who passionately followed this story who just were not satisfied with that explanation, and they never said it. But it appeared to people following the case closely that the police weren't exactly satisfied with that explanation either. Let's be real. In today's world, all it would have taken were a few clicks of Nicole's mouse or a scroll on her phone to find Shannon's Facebook and Instagram pages. Everyone knows that if you're single and you meet someone this day and age, the first thing you do, the first thing you do is go check out their social media platforms. You go look them up online and find out not only who they are today, but who they've been before you met them. And if they have an ex, you're going to know about it and you go right to their page too. You are just straight up lying if you claim you don't. I don't believe that for a second. And this wasn't an ex. This is somebody that tells you, I'm still married. We're getting a divorce. Well, you know what? Anybody with any self-awareness is going to say, really? Well, let me just go look and see what was posted yesterday, what was posted last week. If you're telling me this is an amicable divorce and that you're really separated, you're living under one roof purely for financial reasons, then that's going to be reflected on these social media platforms because there's going to be some individuality. We're not going to be seeing all this togetherness, all these family interactions. You're not going to see this wife sitting in the husband's lap. You're not going to be seeing all this togetherness. Anyone can figure this out if you take a look. If Nicole were to have checked out either Chris or Shannon's social media, nothing would have indicated that there was a divide and certainly not that there was a looming divorce. In fact, Shannon was frequently posting about how excited she was to add to her family nest. She was always posting about how much she loved her husband, loved her life. Is it really plausible that Nicole didn't do a little digging? Really not even digging, just clicking on her new man and his soon-to-be ex. Just think, put yourself in that situation. What would you do? And then tell me if you buy what she's selling. You start falling for somebody. He's transparent enough to say, look, I'm married, sort of. It's really all over with. The legal system, that crank turns really slow. We're very amicable about this. It's all settled. We're just waiting for the wheels of justice to turn. And you say, I'm fine with that. But are you telling me you're not going to go click just out of curiosity to learn about your new man? You're telling me you're not curious enough to go find out if everything he's telling you is true. Police may have had the same thought. They may have thought, well, you know, maybe she's not saying everything she knows because as they continued to investigate Chris, they started looking into Nicole as well. 
She's supposedly their advocate. She's supposedly their inside track to what's going on. And they're talking to her. They're encouraging her. Can I get you something to drink? Have a seat. Let's chat. But she's not out the door before they're checking on her as well. And they found that while she was being very forthcoming about certain things, that she wasn't necessarily telling the whole story. They found out that she was deliberately holding some things back. They asked her to turn over her phone. She was hesitant. She eventually handed her device over to investigators. And the text messages and internet searches they found made them take even a closer look at her actions before, during, and after Shannon, Bella, and Celeste murders. And here's where things don't allegedly track with what Nicole told police. On July 24th, 2018, during the height of Nicole and Chris's relationship, Nicole searched Google for, quote, man I'm having an affair with says he will leave his wife. Now hear what I just said. This is about two and a half, three weeks before these tragic murders take place. She obviously has some questions here because she Googles the phrase, quote, man I'm having affair with says he will leave his wife. Nicole didn't search about dating a separated man or how it would work to date a divorced man with children. She specifically Googled affair. Interesting choice of words for a woman who is adamant that she thought her man was separated, simply waiting for some paperwork. On August 8th, she's back to Googling. This time, the phrase is marrying your mistress. She also did a Google search for wedding dresses and spent hours searching for gowns online. So we've got a woman who is Googling married men, affairs, and wedding dresses, all right before her lover's wife and children are brutally murdered. Now, is this a coincidence? You know, maybe. Maybe she thinks that the divorce is getting ready to come through and so he's going to be available. But it doesn't take a genius to consider the possibility that Nicole was hoping for a future with this guy and that she knew she was having a full-blown secret affair, not just dating a separated man who was back on the market. Police also immediately saw that Nicole had deleted many of the texts and photos she had shared with Chris. People who have nothing to hide, hide nothing. Well, Nicole thought she had deleted them, but they don't really go away. And police were able to retrieve them, retrieve them all. It just seems like it's always the phone that gets you in these stories, isn't it? Once something is searched or sent, even if you delete it, it's just never really gone. It's like a bad rash. I can't tell you the amount of times Google searches and texts come back and just bite people in the butt. Of course, police's first question was why had Nicole deleted texts between herself and Chris in the first place? What was she trying to hide? Well, her explanation was simple. She said she was grossed out by Chris after finding out from news articles that he wasn't separated from his wife and that Shannon was pregnant when she disappeared. So understand what she's asking you to believe now is that she only learned this when she read it in the newspaper. She hadn't clicked on her. She hadn't gone to her Instagram. She hadn't gone to her Facebook. She hadn't done any investigation at all. He just told her at work, I'm separated, getting a divorce, just waiting for the paperwork to go through. And she just said, okay. She didn't look. She didn't check. She didn't do anything that takes nothing more than a click of a mouse. We know she knows how to click that mouse because we know she clicked it about married man says he's leaving his wife. We know she clicked it about getting a wedding gown. We know she clicked it about other things, but never clicked it to look into his current living situation. I'm sorry. I have a hard time with that. But we'll come back to that. So what had she deleted? Well, it was mostly just lovey-dovey back and forth. Chris might have been shy and soft-spoken in real life and cold and disconnected when texting his own wife, 
But in his conversations with Nicole, he comes across like a real-life Romeo, or at least a Don Juan wannabe. Some of the recovered text messages from Chris to Nicole read as follows. Hope you had a great night, beautiful. Miss you. Get home safe. Sweet dreams, my sexy empanada. Chris sent that text message the evening of August 11th, two days before he brutally murdered Shad Ann and his two innocent children. It seemed Chris also wanted Nicole to see the best in him. He sent Nicole this text about his character. I'm about loyalty, truthfulness, and being dedicated. I don't like playing games unless it's role-playing. Wink face emoji. I'll give you a minute to throw up in your mouth. It's interesting that Chris points out that he's all about loyalty and truthfulness when he's deceiving both his wife and his mistress, according to her. Apparently, you can tell he's lying when his lips are moving. He's lying to his wife. He's lying to his mistress. Maybe he's lying to himself. But when somebody starts telling you that they're loyal and truthful and dedicated, only thing that's going to make me more nervous than that is if they start telling me they're a deacon in the church. When people just start erping this up, unsolicited, talk about red flags, it's like a Navy flagman on the end of the deck. That's just how obvious that is to me. Now, arguably, one of the most telling texts Chris sent Nicole during their many communications was this. Chris writes, Being in your life is something I crave. Now, here's why that one is important to study. This wasn't a man saying he craved sex with this woman. Plenty of affairs are purely physical. They're just about lust. No, what Chris was saying was he wanted to be in this woman's life. But did Chris crave being in Nicole's life enough that he felt like he needed to erase his own? That he felt like he needed to erase the family he had in his current life? Everybody has asked the question, if he wanted out so bad, get a divorce. If you want it out so bad, just leave. Abandon them. Anything is better than family annihilation. Why would you do that? Why would you have to do that? If you don't want to be there, leave. But a narcissist sees things only from their point of view. And understand, from his point of view, if he can just eradicate these people from the face of the earth, then A, he becomes the victim. Oh, poor Chris. B, there's no alimony, there's no child support, there's no legal fees. In fact, it could turn into a profit center. Now, while Shannon and the girls were visiting her family in North Carolina, Chris was keeping busy working out, trying to look his best, and wooing his mistress with racy text and love letters. He was quoting country and reggae songs and buying the cold, mushy greeting cards with giant hearts all over them. In one handwritten letter, Chris wrote, this is a quote. The first day I saw you, you took my breath away. The first day I had the guts to talk to you, I got lost in those stunning green eyes. The first day we hung out in the park together, I knew I was addicted. Big things will happen this year. Dreams will come true. It makes you wonder what big things Chris was referring to exactly, doesn't it? Did he have a plan percolating in his head that he was going to carry out in order to make his dreams come true? There were no dreams that were going to be coming true for anyone involved in this mess. No dreams, only nightmares. Meanwhile, Shannon was out buying relationship self-help books. She was out working to try to find a way to save her marriage with Chris. Instead of taking this gesture as an olive branch, Chris threw one of the books in the garbage. It could have very well been a metaphor for how he felt about her. He was checked out, done, ready to throw the relationship away and her with it. He wanted to be rid of his old life in favor of a shiny new one. You just wonder how much Nicole knew. And you wonder what she would have thought if someone had whispered to her, if he'll do it with you, he'll do it to you. But from the very beginning, the burning and heartbreaking question has been, 
If Chris was that unhappy, if he felt that burdened, if he felt that trapped, why not just get a divorce? Why did he have to kill her? Shannon's mother said she knows her daughter would have walked away without a problem. She knew that her daughter had enough dignity, had enough self-respect, had enough self-worth that she did not want to be where she was not welcome. Could something Nicole told her friend be a clue to his mindset, a clue to why he took this drastic action? When Nicole first spoke to detectives, she claimed that she hadn't told anyone about her relationship with Chris, but it wasn't, but just a few days later, she changed her story and admitted to police she had in fact confided in one friend about her relationship with Chris. Just one day before Shannon and the sweet little girl's death, Nicole told her friend the one thing she didn't like about Chris was the fact that he had already had children. She felt she might always be second best, and it bothered her that he had, quote, been there, done that. It makes you wonder, what if she mentioned those feelings to Chris? If he thought he might lose her because he was encumbered with a ready-made family. If he thought Nicole felt he would have divided loyalties that she would always be second to his existing family, to his existing children. Maybe not to Shannon, but Celeste and Bella. Would she always be the other one? If he thought that was a big concern of hers and that he might lose her because she was threatened by his children, could that be the answer to why? Why he couldn't just leave? why he had to get rid of the children and his wife permanently? Did he really just want to be with Nicole at any cost? And had she messaged to him that she wasn't going to be second fiddle to anyone or anything? And had he interpreted that to mean, you better show up with a clean slate, buddy. But Nicole insisted she had not disclosed her worries about his children to Chris, only to the friend that she had said she had not talked to. Because remember, she said she didn't tell anybody. The police have a witness here, a helper here, that lies one minute, tells the truth the next. So you have to wonder, are you lying now or are you lying then? Because you know she's lying, you just don't know when, which is a lie, which is the truth. But she says she didn't tell Chris she was just venting to a friend. This is right after she said she didn't vent to anybody. Did you ever say anything to him Never. about like... Never. Uh, anything about his kids being a problem? Anything about his wife being a problem? Never. Never. This shocked me just as much as I think it shocked the rest of the world. Ugh. He's so disgusting. I'm so ashamed of him. Why? 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 Uh, how? I don't even understand how you could like bring yourself to do that to somebody who's like that big. <laughs> Nicole said she believes that she in no way influenced Chris to kill his family. She stated to police, quote, I legitimately think his cheese was sliding off his cracker long before he met me. Is that why she fell in love with him? Nicole also texted that same friend, quote, like, he seems too good to be true. Well, which is it? His cheese is sliding off his cracker? Or he's too good to be true? Again, it's just inconsistent. Certainly turns out she was right about his warped mind. In the days after her initial statement to police, she would frequently call detectives with additional information that she just remembered. I guess she was just sitting around and like, oh, wait a minute. Chris and Nicole spoke the night before and quite a bit on the day of his family's disappearance. For most of the day, Chris told her he was busy with work, but the two exchanged text messages throughout the day as if everything was normal, as if Chris hadn't just murdered his family and concealed their bodies. Chris's day was busy because the tower of lies he had built were crashing down and he was telling so many lies it was just impossible to keep up. 
Now, again, here's a window into his psyche. You know, I've told you that narcissists have no empathy. They have no capacity to feel sorrow or remorse or to vicariously experience the pain that someone else might be feeling. That's why he has the ability to murder his pregnant wife and unborn child and then ultimately his two innocent children, one of which looks at him in the eye and says, you're not going to do to me what you did to her, are you? But he can then whip out his phone and flirt with his mistress like he was on the way to Arby's or something. That takes a special kind of cold-blooded, detached psyche. It was at 3.45 p.m. that Chris finally sent an ominous text message to Nicole telling her that his family was gone. Naturally, this sent Nicole into a tailspin. What did he mean? Gone where? What did he think had happened? Chris was evasive and, according to Nicole, didn't seem terribly concerned. She was struck by how emotionless he seemed about his family being missing. Instead, Nicole told police that Chris remained vague with his answers regarding what was going on and kept trying to change the subject, which, of course, made her suspicious. Nicole also spoke to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation agent Kevin Kobach, about an eerie late-night FaceTime call she had with Chris on Monday, August 13th. Now, remember, his wife and children had been missing since that morning. I think we, we were, like, talking a little bit, but he, like, he was laying down on a mattress that didn't have any sheets on it. And I remember asking him, like, where's your sheet, you know? And he's like... He's like, oh, I lost him. And I remember he was saying that he was cleaning himself um, to try to keep busy to take his mind off of things. I didn't honestly think that much about it originally because that man is always cleaning. Like, he's a very, very, like, organized, meticulous, clean individual. So it did not seem like a super red flag to me. Like, on his days off, he organizes just it's what he does. Of course, we now know why Chris had no sheets on his mattress. Remember, police found bed sheets in the trash at the Watts residence and also a bloodied sheet wrapped around Shannon's deceased body. A drone search located a lone bed sheet on the oil field property. This aerial discovery was what initially led police to finding the bodies of Shannon, Bella, and Celeste. So now, Chris is FaceTiming his mistress from his marital bed the very same bed he had strangled his wife on just hours before. He's now lying in this bed, feet up, comfortable, FaceTiming his mistress. Nicole mentioned that during that FaceTime conversation, Chris had also said that the blankets in Bella and Celeste's room were missing and that he thought Shannon might have taken them. But why would Shannon have taken the children's blankets when she left for a so-called play date? A play date that, when asked about it, he said, I, I don't know where. She just took them somewhere to play. By Tuesday the 14th, Chris and Nicole's romance, well, it was just abruptly over. All of their remaining correspondence had to do with Nicole confronting Chris about lying about Shannon's pregnancy. According to Nicole, Chris kept trying to change the subject and would not give her any straight answers. Now, of the many lies Chris Watts has told, this one has got to be one of the most cruel and frankly stupid. When Nicole demanded answers about Shannon's pregnancy and why Chris had not told her about it, Nicole says Chris told her that he didn't know until the day that Shannon disappeared that she was expecting. He then told Nicole that he was not the father. 
According to Nicole, she said it was at this point that she realized she was dealing with a serial liar. If he could lie about this, she thought, what else was he capable of? Nicole expressed to detectives that she was concerned about how the media would perceive her. Nicole's scandalous internet searches were splashed across headlines. It seems like she knew this would be inevitable because of the media culture. She tried to prevent this by deleting her browser history, she thought. Of course, the internet never forgets. So now it just looked even worse. Not only did she have these searches, she had tried to bury the searches. She had tried to hide the searches. And she got caught trying to dump that data. In the wake of Chris becoming the prime suspect in Shan Ann's disappearance, Nicole also researched Shan Ann Watts and Chris Watts online frequently, sometimes for hours. Every time Nicole searched for information on Chris and Shannon Watts, she would immediately delete the search right after. The same day, Nicole also browsed Google for the following questions. Quote, can cops trace text messages? And quote, how long do phone companies keep text messages? As well as, quote, difference between text message content and text message detail. This is all according to police documents. What she should have researched first was, can police track Google searches? After her initial statements to police, after Shannon and her daughter's bodies were found, get this. Nicole searched, quote, Amber Fry. Then she searched, quote, Amber Fry net worth. Then she searched Amber Fry book deal. And then she searched Do People Hate Amber Fry? As much as people compare Chris Watts to Scott Peterson, you can also easily compare Nicole Kissinger to Amber Fry. At least Nicole Kissinger appears to compare Nicole Kissinger to Amber Fry. I assume since she does, other people do. There is one difference that seems to be commonly believed, and that is that Amber Fry 100% did not know that Scott Peterson was married. Nicole Kessinger 100% did know that Chris Watts was married. Amber Fry went on to write a book to be the subject of movies about her life story and to live a successful and happy life. So what has become of Nicole? In this day and age, we know there's a legal court and there is a court of public opinion. And with Twitter and Facebook, those judgmental voices are louder than ever. Certain commenters online were vicious, even alleging that they were convinced that Nicole had something to do with the murders. There was even an online petition circulating called Investigate Nicole Kissinger. When it came to Chris and Nicole's relationship, many believed Nicole's search history and emails proved she was lying and she knew damn well she was dating another woman's husband. Well, I don't think you really need her search history and emails to prove that because she said as much to the police. She knew he was married, it's just where in the dissolution procedure she claims to think things were. He told her he was married, told her they were separated, told her things were going to wind down. So she knew he was married. Her behavior also made it seem like she was complicit in keeping their relationship a secret. They went to out-of-the-way bars and restaurants. They spent most of their time at her apartment. In one of Nicole's messages to Chris, she told him she wanted to continue seeing him and asked, Are we bad people? But whether or not Nicole knew the actual truth about Chris's relationship, the outcome was the same. She had gotten involved with a married father whose face was now splashed all over the front of every newspaper and magazine in the English-speaking world. And the word murderer was right next to his name. 
No matter how much Nicole may have wanted to erase or delete Chris and their brief involvement from her life, it seems that from now on their names will be forever linked. Nicole mentioned that she and her friends were trying to do damage control by taking down her social media accounts and removing the photos that existed of her on Facebook. Well, it was too late. Everywhere you looked, on TV, in magazines, newspapers, there were photos of Nicole Kissinger, the other woman. It's likely there won't be a book deal in Nicole's future. There are alleged accounts of her going into witness protection due to the amount of harassment and threats that she has received since this all came to light. She has never given a televised interview. Me and my team have reached out to her several times ourselves. And people will tell you, if nothing else, about me is I give people an opportunity to tell their story. Whether it's believable, unbelievable, outrageous, whatever, I give people a chance to tell their story. And then I ask the questions that people want to know the answer to. We've reached out to her time and time and time again. She's never called us back and has not been spotted publicly since. But her role in this horror story just might not have been completely done. Not just yet. On August 21st, 2018, Chris shuffled into court with his attorneys, clad in an orange inmate suit, glasses and handcuffs. He was a far cry from the good-looking all-American dad that he had presented to the world just days before. He looked somber, already older. It was over for him. The courtroom was packed. Everyone wanted to hear what Chris Watts was going to be charged with. The judge denied him bail. In the front row of the courtroom, Shanann's father, Frank, and his son, Frankie, sobbed while the charges were read. The DA's office charged Chris with nine counts. He was charged with three counts of first-degree murder after deliberation for the deaths of Shanann, Celeste, and Bella Watts. Now, let me say that again. Three counts of first-degree murder after deliberation. That means he didn't snap. This wasn't a crime of passion. He didn't fly into a rage. This was murder after deliberation, after thought. Two counts of first degree murder for causing the death of a person under the age of 12 while being in a position of trust. One count of unlawful termination of a pregnancy. Three counts of tampering with a deceased body. If convicted of all nine charges, Chris was potentially facing the rest of his life in prison and could face the death penalty. He made the decision to save his own life. I think he did that because he knew what he knew. And he knew that this could be figured out pretty easy. Although he still maintained that Shannon had killed the children, so he killed her, Chris took responsibility for all three deaths in court. He pleaded guilty to the charges. In exchange, he would not face the death penalty. So, Chris was now behind bars for good, and no matter what story he spun, he would pay for these heinous crimes. So the nightmare seemed over. The legal system seemed to have done its job. But as I've said many times, we do have a legal system. We don't have a justice system. You go to the courthouse to pursue charges. You don't go to the courthouse for justice. Because you walk up those steps, you go through that door, you go in that courtroom, and there's all this mahogany wood, and there's this judge up on the bench, and there's a big seal behind him or her. There's all this pomp and circumstance. There's a lot of words spoken, a lot of decisions handed down, verdicts meted out, but nowhere among them is justice. Because the only justice would be for Shannon, Celeste, Bella, and this unborn child to be back in this world. That's not going to happen. That would be justice. But given the limits of the system, what could be done was done. And the nightmare seemed to be over. But investigators, not the prosecutors, but the investigators, well, they weren't quite done. After all this... They went back in to interview him again, one more time from prison. 
So what was their reason for this additional question? They got everything they can get, right? The legal system has worked. You can't try him for the same crimes twice. That's double jeopardy. So they've gotten all they're going to get. So why talk to him again? Well, we don't know for sure. But we do know that it would not make sense for them to be talking to him about further culpability on his part. They already have him. He pleaded guilty. They had recovered the bodies. Did it really matter what other details he added to the situation? He was locked up and paying the price regardless of what he now said. Shannon's parents had a theory. They strongly believe the reason the FBI went into that prison was because of none other than Mistress Nicole. Shannon's mother claims she believes investigators went in on a mission to get Chris to roll on his mistress. He did not, at least not yet. And again, she has never been implicated or charged with any crime. It turns out the worst thing that Nicole did in the eyes of the law at this point is to fall in love with the wrong man. But whatever the reason was that they went in for, they came out with way more than they ever could have bargained for. They came out with a real confession from Chris Watts, an admission of exactly when and how he, not Shan Ann, killed his two beautiful and innocent daughters. And his entire confession was recorded on tape. We were able to find out what was on those confession tapes before anyone else. Shan Ann's parents were told the grim and horrifying details before they were released to the media and they wanted to be the ones to tell the world. They didn't want this to come out from some third party. They wanted to be the ones that reported this because they wanted to dignify their daughter. Understand at this point, the world had been told that their daughter had murdered their grandchildren. And they sat there powerless to do anything about it. They sat there with some people in America believing that their precious daughter had murdered their precious grandchildren. And add that to the loss of their daughter and grandchildren, and it was almost more than they could endure. And finally, this monster excuse for a human being told the truth. And they wanted the satisfaction of reporting that to the world. They contacted us. They wanted me to come there and help them tell that story. They would do an interview with me and reveal for the first time what Chris finally confessed he had really done to their beautiful daughter and their grandchildren, what he said to the children, what he said the children witnessed, and what their final words were to their, quote, daddy. So I flew to Pinehurst and sat down with them. And they told me not only what was in that confession, but what this had done to their family. And I'm going to tell you on the next episode of The Devil Beside Me, the Chris Watts story. Husband, father, killer.